All right, we're going to um, learn about other patterns of inheritance that don't necessarily follow um, Mendel's simple kind of um, results that we see in normal Punnett squares like dominant and straight recessive. So um, first type, um, so Mendel's principles offer a set of rules with which to predict various patterns of inheritance. There are exceptions, though, to every rule and exceptions to the exceptions. So what happens if one allele is not completely dominant over another? What if a gene has several alleles? Um, so beyond dominant and recessive, so what are some um, exceptions we're going to talk about? Some alleles are neither dominant nor recessive, we'll talk about that. Um, many genes exist in several different forms and therefore are said to be multiple alleles, so we'll see that in a bit. And then many traits are produced by the interaction of several genes. Um, so despite the importance of Mendel's work, there are important exceptions to most of his principles. In most organisms, genetics is more complicated because the majority of genes have actually more than two alleles. Um, so like it's not just like a big B, little B, or a little B, little B, or big B, big B. Um, in addition, many important traits are controlled by more than one gene. So Mendel's principles alone cannot just always predict traits that are controlled by multiple alleles or multiple genes. So one example is something called incomplete dominance. So there's not a true dominance. Um, so a cross between these types of plants called four clocks. Um, when you cross those, you often see the exception, what, this type of exception to Mendel's principle. Um, so here um, we have the parent, um, the parent generation, big R, big R for like red, and big W, big W for white. When you cross those, you get all these like heterozygous big R, big W. And you see that the um, phenotype is actually pink, which is like a blending of the parent phenotypes. So whenever you see kind of like a blending of phenotypes um, in the F1 generation, the blending of the parent phenotypes, that's, that's going to be an incomplete dominance where we don't have like red um, over white. They're going to work together, they're blending together to make this phenotype. So yes, again, so in this case neither allele is dominant. Cases in which one allele is not completely dominant over the other is called incomplete dominance. So in incomplete dominance the heterozygous phenotype, like in this case here, lies somewhere between the two homozygous phenotypes. Um, another type is called co-dominance. Um, this is cases where the, which phenotype, the phenotypes produce are both alleles are clearly expressed. So that's called co-dominance. So like when you work with someone, um, you're cooperating when you, uh, or you're a co-worker, so you're both working together for one task. Um, here both alleles are expressed at the same time. So for example, in certain types of um, chicken, the elite, uh, the allele for black feathers is co-dominant for the allele with white feathers. So here is one that has both black and white feathers. Um, so that is um, erminent, but we'll just say black and white. But the heterozygous genotype has this phenotype where you see both of the alleles being expressed at the same time. Um, you also have multiple alleles. Um, a single gene can have many possible alleles. So a gene with more than one, more than two alleles is said to have multiple alleles. Um, many genes have multiple alleles, including like human genes for blood type. This is the most common you see here for this type of um, situation. Um, this chart shows the just general percentage of the population in the U.S. that has the blood group. Like I'm A positive. I just found that out a couple years ago when I was pregnant. Um, so more about blood types here. Um, because we'll do some Punnett square problems with it. Um, blood types are determined by what type of antigen, which is like an ID marker, that's on your blood. So for example, this is blood type A because they're symbolizing the pink circles being antigen A. So when you have blood type A, you produce antibodies, things that would attack B blood. Um, when you're type B, you have these blood cells with antigen B, so it's saying, hey, I'm a B type of a cell, and you produce antibodies against type A blood. So this would um, kind of clump up if it was mixed with A type blood. That's why a type B person can't get type A blood because they have these antibodies that attack that A blood. Um, a person that's AB has both antigens a and B and their blood, so they don't have any antibodies, so they can receive any blood type because um, they don't have antibodies that would attack the foreign blood. Type O people have no antigens on their blood, so no um, 
little ID markers, they produce both antibodies A and B. So blood type O people can only receive bl blood type O because they have antibodies A that would attack A blood and antibodies B that would attack B blood. Um, you also have, this is a little more, looks a little crazy here, but you also, just to point out, you also can be positive or negative. That is if you have this RH little identification marker, this RH antigen. So up here are all of your negative, type A negative, B negative, AB negative. They don't have this little RH um, antigen. Down here are all your positive ones. Um, so if you're type A, you have the A antigen and the RH um, antigen. So that's what just the difference between negative and positive type of blood. Um, when you're doing like a Punnett square with genotypes of type A blood, the I stands for immunoglobin, which is just meaning um, like an antibody. So if you're type A, your genotype could be um, IAIA or IA little i. Um, so you would be type A blood. If you're type B, IBIB or IBI. If you're AB, you're I. IA, IB, and if you're O, you're just the little I's with no A or B antigen. So if you did a cross here, crossing a person with AB blood with a person with heterozygous for B blood, um, here's the AB person, so IA, IB, cross with a heterozygous B person, which would be IB little I. So there are possibilities of children. They can have a 25% chance of a child having type AB blood. They can have 50% chance of having a child with B blood, because both of these would be a type B blood person. And then they have 25% um, chance of having children with 25% uh, um, type A. So notice they cannot have a type O person. So if somehow they had a baby with type O, there might have been some accident, a switch in the hospital, which would be bad news. Um, also, you can figure out blood typing based on like results like this. So to determine a person's blood type, a drop of anti-A serum, like antibody A, and drop of anti-B serum are placed at either the either end. So here, anti-A is being put on each slide. Anti-B is being put here. Um, then, a drop of each person's blood is added to each drop of serum. Clumping an anti-A serum or anti-B serum indicates the presence of antigen A or B, respectively. So if you clump in anti-A, you're type A person. If you're clumping in type B, antibody B, that means you have the antigen B um, happening. So in this slide, slide one, we see clumping in the anti-A, so you are, if you guess type A, you are correct. Here, um, Anti-A, anti-B, we put blood A in here, blood B in here, we see clumping, so we are type B blood, if you got that right. Um, here, we clumped in both A and B, so you are type, if you guessed AB, you are correct. And here, we had no clumping in when antibody A and antibody B are present, so no, cl no clumping means you are type O blood. All right, another type of different scenario is something called polygenic traits. These are traits that are controlled by two or more genes, meaning like poly means like many, okay? Um, so it means many genes. So polygenic traits often show a wide range of phenotypes, like um, a whole different variety. So like skin color, you can be very light, kind of light, a little darker, medium, kind of dark, and very dark. Eye color, going from like brown, or dark, dark brown, light brown, hazel, green, all sorts of mixtures there, blue. Heights, you can be like, you know, a big range from like four foot five to like six foot five. So there's all these ranges we see in our population. So the variety of skin color in humans, yes, comes um, about partly because more than one, more than four genes probably control this trait. So interesting picture here. Um, these, these girls are actually fraternal twin girls. They're not identical, but they're fraternal twin girls. So I'm guessing the parents here are mixed eth ethnicity. Um, so um, this child got more of the um, genes for lighter skin, and this child got more of the genes for darker skin. Um, so just very interesting. Um, genes the environment. So does the environment have a role in how genes are determined? Um, yes, environmental conditions can affect gene expression and influence genetically determined traits. Um, so the characteristics of any organism are not just determined basic, um, solely on the genes of that organism. Genes provide a plan for development, but how the plan unfolds also depends on the environment. Um, the phenotype of an organism is only partially determined by its genotype. So for example, there's these white butterflies, the western white butterfly. 
um, they hatch in the summer and have different color patterns on their wings than those hatching in the spring. Um, studies revealed that butterflies hatching in springtime had greater levels of pigment in their wings versus those hatching in summer. So in other words, the environment, like the temperature um, in which the butterflies develop influences the expression of their genes for wing color. Um, so, for example, so to clarify this more, in order f for the flies to fly effectively, the body temperature of the western white butterfly needs to be between 28 and 40 degrees Celsius. So, more pigmentation allows butterflies to reach the warm body temperature. So, those would be like the ones in the spring. They need to retain more um, heat in order for them to fly uh, more effectively. So, they end up having more darker pigmentation. The ones that are developing the hot summer months, it's very hot, so they need to kind of cool their um, wings off in order to fly properly. So less pigmentation is going to absorb less heat. So those are your um, more white-based butterflies of these types. So just as, this is just an example to show that, yeah, the environment can affect how genes are expressed. All right, that is it. Thanks.